I would like to thank Professor Murat for inviting me to be here. And um, my main interest is to see whether, in medicine in general, an evolutionary point of view has not been taken into account or has not been taken into account for trying to develop new treatments for uh, uh, pathologies. Although, that, and this is what I'm trying to uh, explain, is that it might be beneficial if you want to develop new concepts for treatments, for example, related to uh, phantom percepts. So the, the two key points that I uh, remember from uh, Professor Morassi's introduction is first of all that evolution is a, is a multi-phase uh, uh, process, dynamical process, and that it, as he mentioned in his introduction, that it's not only a yes or no, but it can be yes or yes, uh, I, yes and no idea. And the second thing is that it's a double-edged sword. And of course, um, if we consider phantom percepts as plasticity, then we can also consider it as maladaptive plasticity. So not every um, evolutionary aspect for changing uh, brain might be um, might be beneficial. So there, um, well, you all know there is some fact about the brain that in general men seem to have more um, brain than women, even though the the IQ is the same for men and women. So which already means that the amount of cells itself is not very important, but probably the connections in between the cells and thus the, the networks that are formed in the brain are um, very important. Also know that we lose a lot of neurons every single day, and so this loss has to be compensated properly by developing more connections, and which suggests that if the connections are not hardwired, that are changing constantly. For those who are not from the biological field, um, a brain consists of a couple of different um, lobes, which can be then subdivided in different areas on, based on a chemoarchitectonic structure. And it has been considered that certain parts of the brain have certain functions, although that this is now considered uh, partially phrenological in the sense that there is some areas, for example, the occipital lobe, which is related more to vision, the uh, superior temporal lobe, which is related more to uh, the auditory system, and uh, the anterior part of the parietal lobe uh, related to the sensory system. Now, uh, uh, this modular buildup, uh, you can go down and basically then create um, a, a structure where you have a kind of a um, and it's modeling somewhat the sensory system, meaning that certain aspects of, um, of the motor system are located at a certain place. And you have the same thing for the, um, for the auditory system, where, uh, for example, the higher frequencies are located more medially and the lower frequencies more laterally, which you can then try to visualize by using fMRI or other, um, other tests. Now the question, uh, a relatively stupid question, is why, why would we have a brain? Now there is an interesting story which was first told in the book I of the Cortex by Adolf Lienert, that the sea squirt, when it's still in its larval stage, just swims around, and it has a primitive ner uh, nervous system, and on the moment that it, um, that it decides to go and sit on a rock and not move anymore, it basically absorbs a digestive system. So it could be considered that only if you move around or if the environment is changing quite a bit, that you need uh, a nervous system and that the change has, has to be, um, can be of course uncertain, but it should be predictable. A completely random environment would not uh, be beneficial for developing a brain as the brain could not be uh, predicted. So from that simple point of view, brains can be considered uh, prediction machines that basically use information from previous uh, exper uh, experiences to predict future events. Ultimately, I think, this is to reduce uncertainty coming from the changing environment, and that's important for survival. So if you, if you encounter this, that should tell you something of going back to, to swim in the same area the next time. So the brain has to, has to be processing information, and, and most of you know this a lot better than I do, but information cons, um, consists of the content of information and a certain amount of redundancy, which you also um, see in the brain. Now, the, uh, and the content of the information basically means the, the amount 
amount of uncertainty that's um, around that you can reduce. And redundancy is what we already know, what we know, and this can be considered a protection against error. And so, for example, if you read this, this short uh, line, if you leave out one or two letters, you won't understand anything anymore of what, what it means. Whereas if you read the full sentence, you can leave out a couple of letters. And, and still understand what's happening. And in the brain, we see the same thing. For example, our arousal system, which goes from the posterior pons to the mesencephalon and then to the internal nuclei, has, is developed bilaterally so that if, if you take out by stroke or hemorrhage or whatever, one side, you will be comatose for about a couple of days. But then basically, the, the redundant part, the, the second part will take over and you will come uh, back out of consciousness. So if this information is important uh, in order to reduce the uncertainty from the environment, then it has to be transmitted, and it's considered that it's, that it's transmitted by, uh, by trains of action uh, potentials. And some theoretical work has very more suggested that uh, the higher the firing rate, the more information can be transmitted. Similarly, like the quicker I talk, the more information I can convey in the same uh, period of time up to a certain moment when, uh, when it plateaus. And if, if I start talking too quickly, well, there won't be a lot of information being transmitted anymore either. So from a clinical point of view, this has been, um, this has been um, considered as well when we look at the, uh, at the EEG. And the assumption of the EEG is that it's a, that it's a combination of different spectra occurring, occurring simultaneously, not only in the tonic firing mode, but also in burst mode, which is more like like uh, AK-47 uh, salvo of uh, action potentials. Now, we, we know that the quicker your oscillation rate, um, the, the more it is related to, um, to consciousness in general. And these oscillations have actually been uh, preserved throughout uh, evolution and consist from fre frequencies going from uh, 0.05 hertz to about 500 hertz, and they seem to be um, to be um, there seems to be linear progression on an, on a natural uh, logarithmic scale. So these oscillations you can find in very primitive animals as well as in uh, in humans, and seem to have similar functions. For example, some practical um, examples: the in reptiles, um, the main power spectrum of the EEG at, at the medial cortex is delta, which is uh, clinically assumed to be the lowest frequency that we routinely use in, the, in the clinical practice. And uh, delta activity is what, in general, you see in the brain stem, but also in the, in the reward system, which is most likely a, a misnomer and should maybe better be called a, a learning system. Whereas in, in more primitive uh, mammals, uh, the mean EEG power spectrum at, at the hippocampus um, is 4 to 7 hertz, which you still see in, uh, in uh, modern mammals, such as humans as well. Although at the cortical level, the, um, the main frequency is at least um, alpha. If you go, if you um, look at it not from a phylogenetic point of view, but from an ontogenetic point of view, and you just look at the increase in the processing speed or oscillation rate in um, at the occipital lobe, ontogenetically, then you see that there is a progressive uh, increase in uh, oscillation rate, um, also ontogenetically. And interestingly, when you um, look at it in, in reverse, for example, in Alzheimer, then the normal uh, increase in processing speed seems to seems to be re seems to be reversed, where um, the higher frequencies seem to tend to fall out and get more and more processing in lower frequencies. So Paul McLean has developed this uh, well-known model where he says, well, there's uh, evolutionary, there's three stages to brain development where you have your brain stem, um, which is a survival brain just related to processing um, critical information with, with, with regards to uh, respiration and heart rate, uh, feeding behavior, sexual behavior, and etc. But it is, most of it is just simple reflexes. Whereas uh, on top of it, you have a kind of a mantle consisting of uh, what he calls the, the limbic lobe, which you could 
almost consider as, a, as an emotional brain. And considering emotions as nothing more than a priority mode, these emotions are, are just telling you, um, well, you have to respond to this stimulus and not to another stimulus because the stimulus is more important. And basically, uh, conceptually, you could consider it as a kind of a dimmer function. And the modern animal um, developed neocortex, which can be then the, the predictive brain, um, trying to anticipate um, information so that you can better respond to it. Now, from a clinical point of view, if, if, you, if you accept this, if you accept this model, then you can start to think of pathologies not only in anatomical um, constructs, but also related to oscillation rates. And so if you have a pathology, for example, related to the reward system, and if you want to try and modulate it, then you want to try and know what is the normal oscillation rate being presented to the reward system in, in order to be able to try and restore that. So therefore, um, I try to come up with a theoretical uh, model which is con constantly being uh, changed where based on this phylogenetic idea. So if you have a sensory stimulus that comes in, it will go to your brainstem where the information is already uh, modulated by, uh, by a different uh, neurotransmitter systems. And there it goes to the uh, phylogenetically oldest part of the uh, sensory uh, system, which is the interlandular nucleus of the thalamus, which is also the, um, the link between the arousal system and the content um, of consciousness uh, information system. Now, this information will then go to the ventral striatum and the dorsal striatum, and, vent, um, and from there you will get a reflectory uh, motor output. Now, considering the fact that if, if you start move, if you start moving, your heart rate and your um, respiration have to follow as well. It's, it's not strange to see that from the same area you get uh, direct connections to the hypothalamus, which is important for your um, autonomic output. And this motor and uh, autonomic output then can be modulated either by cognition or in uh, emotion already. Um, most likely in a primitive species. And the, cent the central hub and the network for emotion might be the amygdala, not just for fear, but also for other um, emotions. And conceptually, um, a hub for cognition might be um, the hippocampus. Now, when you, um, if, you have, if you have a certain response, both motor and autonomic, then you have to learn whether that response is good so whether it's, it's better than, than what you predicted or not, and that's where you have a reward system or a primitive learning system which is centered initially on the, on the nucleus accumbens as part from the ventral striatum. Now, so this, this uh, phylogenetically oldest part of McLean's uh, network can be anatomically located in these uh, areas, and the brainstem itself, uh, and the, a large part of the hypothalamus might actually be also um, not only oscillating, but also firing, and in delta firing rate. Now, this reflexive behavior would then need a dimmer in order to not just respond always in the same fashion, and therefore you develop um, a, a second layer, which is predominantly centered on, on the <coughs> cingulate cortex. So you have the anterior cingulate, subgenual, um, the, the supergenual, and the posterior part, which might be related more to the cognitive system, and the, um, and the anterior signal more to the uh, emotional system, whereas the subgenital, at least in, in primitive animals, is considered the, the visceral motor part of the, of, the, um, uh, of the cortex. Now, so the, se the phylogenetic, phylogenetic second layer, according to McLean's model, might then just modulate whatever is happening in the more primitive state. And interestingly, um, at least in humans, the singlet uh, seems to oscillate in theta, and the generator um, come predominantly from here, um, but also from the, uh, from the hippocampal area. And then, of course, um, you can develop other, just based on anatomical connections, other structures that then permit a controlled execution of what you want to, uh, what you want to look at. So you can then um, put some speed back and speed forward conditioning in um, and look at even more connections, but then you get a model which
which is not practically applicable anymore. Because if you're going to put an electrode somewhere around here, well, doesn't, this, this schedule is too difficult to predict anything of what's going to be modulated when you, when you just stimulate. So from a practical point of view, we have to develop simpler ideas of how the brain works, at least to be able to use them in a, in a, in a clinical setting. And uh, at this stage, we're still um, right here, um, where we think about miracles when we uh, modulate brain function. So the question is whether an evolutionary point of view can be beneficial. And just like Professor Tsuda has, uh, has, has mentioned, there is an analogy between uh, the brain and nature, and already uh, one of Eccles' uh, students, old Wilhelm Ruh, uh, suggested that there might be an analogy between the brain and, uh, and nature, and then Harry Deacon has written a nice uh, paper on it as well, basically where uh, Deacon considers a synapse as an animal or, or a plant, and the synapse formation um, analogous to animal uh, reproduction, and competition for connections as the same as competition for uh, resources. And so basically, the survival of the fittest synapse can be analogous to the survival of the, of the fittest um, animal. So as we know, the brain is made out of um, 100, billion, 100 billion neurons, more or less, um, containing each a huge amount of synapses so that it cannot be hardwired, um, since we only have about 20 to 30,000 uh, coding genes. So therefore, um, brain wiring has to be plastic and, has, and depends on the input, um, as has been suggested. So the maps are very important uh, in order to develop some structure in the brain. So the, um, if, the, if it's not genetically coded for, where does the information that we all contain come from? Um, well, maybe because our brains are built in an evolutionary way, where growth and reproduction of axons can be considered as growth and reproduction of uh, organisms, and that competition of connection um, depends on competition for resources and mates, more, more um, practically on chemotropic uh, factors. And that the fitness of the connection signal processing uh, might be similar to uh, natural selection. So neural networks will, in, will evolve spontaneously, filling in niches of, uh, of information uh, processes. Similar like species will uh, evolve to fill in niches of the ecosystems. So this is important because if that is correct, then in the moment that you start lacking information, whether it's due to an amputation or you lose sight or hearing, then your neural network will adapt in order to fill up this, uh, this uh, vacant area. So from, from a practical point of view, uh, brains probably adapt to the body they live in uh, with a minimum of pre-planned design. And that's, that's, that's very different from the way that medical doctors in general look at the brain when they say, well, the brain controls the body and that's it. Uh, the body will adapt to what the brain does. But it might be the other way around. And this is important, because, as I mentioned, because emotional deaffrontation or, or any physical kind of deaffrontation will then have an influence on how you can treat it. As, as, uh, as you know, uh, neurons are initially overproduced in an immature stage, and then um, basically when you add a supraluminary lymph, for example, you will get less culling, and so you will have more, uh, you will have more neurons that uh, remain there, and if you remove uh, targets, you get the opposite, so you have uh, more culling occurring, not only at a neuronal level, but also at an axonal level, have the same way. So um, initially you have basically that almost everything is connected to almost everything, and depending on the input, you will get map reorganization, which then ultimately will create topographic maps in the brain, which are uh, the ones I've shown before, the, the, uh, the tomography and the homunculus kind structures. So if you look at it from, um, from in the visual system, you have the topographic maps in the visual cortex, um, and then animals that have uh, a binocular overlap of their visual fields, um, the information also overlaps at the, at the thalamic level and at the cortical level. So this permits to compare input from both eyes um, because at the level of the thalamus, the information from both eyes, if you have um, overlapping visual fields, will be 
be located at, at adjacently, which permits then a depth vision, and at the cortical level, you will get the uh, ocular dominant uh, dominance columns, which have been described by uh, Hugo and Wiesel. Now, if you look at an uh, animal, such as a frog, they don't have an overlapping uh, visual field, and each um, retina um, uh, projects to the contralateral um, superior colliculus, and you don't have these, um, these kind of zebra stripes. Whereas if you graft another eye in the middle of, of the head of the frog, then basically you will get overlapping um, fields, and automatically you do develop you do develop these uh, interdigitated uh, uh, stripe maps, even though this has not been. Uh, um, so in, in one generation, your brain will adapt to the changed to the to the changed body structure, and this this emerges spontaneously without uh, without uh, the process of selection. So not everything has to be selection. So how can we apply this idea to, uh, to medicine? Well, as I mentioned, you've got the monotropic <coughs> map, which, in, which, uh, which is um, uh, located lower frequencies at the outside, higher frequencies at the inside. It starts at the level of the cochlea and it goes all the way through the brainstem to the cortex. And this is, uh, is not genetically coded for, but uh, probably um, created by uh, self-organization and adjusts adjust to the environment. Now, the, so from a practical point of view, sound comes into the ear, it's split up in its different frequencies, and when you, when you have, for example, high frequency hearing loss, you will have a change in plasticity in the auditory cortex. Now, initial studies by Kaz and Schwaber have shown that if you have a normal phenotopic map at the auditory cortex, low frequencies be encoded here, mid frequencies there, and high frequencies uh, at this anatomical area, then if you create a high tone lesion, for example, antibiotics, then um, the area that used to process the high frequencies now seems to respond to mid frequencies. And it, had, and it was considered by Kass and Schwaber that um, basically that the mid frequency uh, neurons now establish connections or get more or less axonal sprouting to, into the area that previously processed um, these um, mid frequencies. So um, this has been then used as a model for tinnitus, where if you here look at the auditory cortex of a cat, these are the, the lower frequencies being processed into this area, mid frequencies being processed in this area, and high frequencies over here. Now, if you create a high frequency hearing loss, um, and you, you, put in, you put in a needle, you present sound, then you will see that these cells become active now at mid frequencies and not high frequencies, because they don't perceive the high frequencies. And in general, the tinnitus percept, which is perceived a symbol like phantom pain, is uh, here in black. The tinnitus percept is um, filling up the gap of hearing loss, so the, the, which is the same in, in phantom pain. If you, if you have a missing hand, you will have pain in the hand and not, not in the face or in other area. So would, that's, a, that's a classical way of thinking, but maybe we can also think of it in another way. Um, that it's not a kind of invasion from the from the mid uh, frequencies into the high frequencies, but that the high frequencies, because they lack information, that they will go and look for information in order to um, in order to survive. This, this can be done by opening dormant synapses, or eventually also by sprouting. So, uh, to come back to the introduction, I think the idea that it doesn't have to be that it doesn't have to be yes or no, that it can be yes and no or that there might be multiple mechanisms that, uh, that might be uh, occurring simultaneously. So from uh, evolutionary philosophy, um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the synapse, the cells that are deprived of information, will go, might go and, um, and look for uh, information. So that there is not an invasion into the vacant territory, but that there is a pulling of information from the where there is still information Around. And uh, there is not a lot of data, although that uh, the last two, three years there is some more data, but in the auditory system it's very, it's very it's lacking. And so you have to do with, uh, with uh, this information where you see that if you, um, if you deafferent the auditory neurons and, and the crickets, and the crickets systems in their, uh, it's in their legs, then 
and basically the, you will get sprouting to go, so if you de-aspirin this, this information, then you will get sprouting to, um, to the area of where the information used to come from. And you uh, also see that if you trim, uh, for example, whiskers and, 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 and mouse, then what you will see is that you basically get uh, more, um, more new um, spines, so dendritic um, growth, um, which is required to, uh, to pull information if you, if you de-afferent information in um, animals. So, uh, that you do not, so that you do not only have axonal growth, uh, but that you can also get dendritic uh, growth, which is, uh, which is largely not considered in, um, in uh, neuroscience for a long time, because it was always considered, well, if there is a deafferentation, you will get um, uh, entry into the vacant territory. Now also, ideologically, you, you, like I mentioned, the tinnitus spectrum is related to what you don't hear. Um, so your brain will basically create information um, for what is not coming in. Conceptually or philosophically almost, uh, you can say that, well, if there is no information around, and remember that the information is, is required in order to increase your survival, then the brain will ultimately create its own information, which is still better than having no information. The, and this is most likely based on what is being stored before. So what is also um, important is that if you have this tonotopic map, which is a, a more Picasso-like um, representation of low frequencies, mid frequencies, high frequencies, and you then represent this, uh, this missing frequencies, for example, you present the animal with 40 decibels of sound above their hearing threshold, then what will happen is that the restructured map, reorganized map, will re, re or will be prevented. So it would suggest that this, uh, this map reorganization is, uh, is reversible, which is important if you want to start using it as a treatment because this, this is most likely associated with tinnitus or the phantom pain, and you want to go back to the original as close as possible. And if this is reversible, then it also means that from a, from a clinical point of view, you can go and target this area in order to reduce <coughs> the missing information directly. Also, based on functional imaging data, you can, you can, um, re you can reconsider these uh, information. Um, so, for example, here you have a tonotopic map low frequencies, mid frequencies, high frequencies, low frequencies at the outside, high frequencies at the inside. And in tinnitus patients, if they perceive 6,000 hertz, um, you will get a change in the tonotopic map and the, the tinnitus frequency is represented adjacent to where you expect it. And the, the, the larger the distance from the, the magnetic field um, to the expected magnetic field, the more intense the tinnitus so the more the brain seems to be re reorganized, the worse the system seems to get as a kind of unfortunate maladaptive um, plasticity. So as I mentioned, you have, you have a, a map which becomes reorganized re um, related to the deafferentation. So the brain um, adjusts to the, um, to the environment and that you can compensate this and then you prevent this reorganization to occur. So from a clinical point of view, if you have a high frequency hearing loss, you get this map uh, reorganization. Then, if we can if we can put, or if we can de deliver the missing information directly, electrically, to this area, then we should also be able to prevent the phantom sound and the phantom pain. So the way you can do that is you can uh, you can present the patients uh, with the tinnitus matched sound in the fMRI scan, and then just look at the areas of bold activation, and then go and, um, and implant an electrode on this area, um, directly delivering the missing information to the area that has been reorganized based on this, uh, on this uh, lack of input. Now, if the classical idea is correct, that there is an invasion, then you would predict that if you stimulate this, you will worsen the symptoms, because um, there is an invasion that might ultimately um, activate the area, and by stimulating it, you will worsen it. Whereas, if, 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 if the other idea is more predominant, meaning that the area just needs this information in order to prevent this reorganization, 
than supplying the missing information only at the area of um, the missing information, which, which you, you can demonstrate by fMRI, then you would expect the tinnitus or the phantom pain to disappear. And so here you see some um, practical uh, examples where you have some bold activation um, related to the tinnitus sound that is being represented in the scanner, and electrodes that are implanted overlying the secondary and primary auditory cortex and what, uh, on a post-operative CT scan. And what you can do is you can fuse these images and then see whether your electrode is, is lying really at the right place. And what you, you can see is that um, depending on the character of the tinnitus, you can decrease um, the sound percept, so the quantum percept, um, very well if it considers a pure tone, not, not for one or another reason, if it's a noise-like um, sound. Um, and if that, is, if that concept seems to work for tinnitus, and we've now implanted about 40 patients with this technique, uh, what you can also do is try to use the same thing for phantom pain because the concept might be similar. And it has been suggested that this uh, reorganization um, of the topographic maps is governed by similar mechanisms of synaptic plasticity. And if that is the case, then you should be able to do exactly the same thing for phantom pain. And what, we, uh, what we've shown is that indeed, if you have phantom pain, what you can do is you can, um, you can worsen the pain um, by allodynia and then look at the fMRI scan where you get abnormal activation and target this area with non-invasive transcranial magnetic stimulation in a neuronavigated way so that you put this information in a kind of GPS system that tells you exactly where to stimulate. You can stimulate non-invasively and if that works, you can go ahead and implant an electrode on this um, area of abnormal activity which conceptually you could uh, consider as the area that has, that has been um, changed by the lack of input. And indeed, you can decrease uh, pain scores fairly dramatically in patients that you have implanted with, um, with electrodes on the uh, somatosensory cortex. Interestingly, if you stimulate at high intensities and high frequencies, you will worsen the pain. And if you stimulate at very low frequencies and very low um, intensities, as if just delivering what is needed, then you, you, um, you decrease the pain. So from a practical point of view, I think um, even if the model is wrong, thinking or, uh, or applying uh, in medicine some more um, evolutionary thoughts uh, might uh, be helpful in developing new treatment because you would consider whether it's physical reapplication, like amputation or hearing loss, but you could also or see that, for example, patients with the Charles Bonnet syndrome who have um, visual hallucinations based on the affrontation, or even an emotional affrontation, that in the future you could try and, and apply the same uh, well, mirror philosophy, if you can say, um, to try and deliver the missing information.